Although World War II is often viewed as a conflict between good and evil, such a simplistic explanation is out of the question for any serious student of the topic. Even minor Axis countries, like Hungary, offer interesting personalities who rose above many others with their dignity and humanity. One such person was General Vilmos Nagy Nagybacon, who served briefly as defense minister during the war. In this video, I take a look at his life and why he should be remembered. Vilmos Nagy was born in 1884 in Transylvania, then part of the Kingdom of Hungary. Despite coming from a poor Sekai family and losing his father at an early age, he finished secondary school with excellent grades, so he could study at the Ludovica Military Academy in Budapest completely for free. The Military Academy in Vienna came next, so by the time World War I started, he was already a captain. He distinguished himself on the Eastern Front, then continued to serve under the liberal regime that failed to defend the country, but also the communist dictatorship that collapsed soon after. He then joined the new Royal Hungarian Army under Admiral Horthy, publishing several books on World War I. In 1936, he predicted that mobility, speed and the element of surprise would be the key factors in a new conflict. During the interwar years, he rose through the ranks, becoming commander of 1st Mixed Brigade, adjutant to the commander-in-chief, quartermaster general at the Ministry of Defense, commander of 1st Corps, and inspector general of the infantry. In 1940, as a colonel general, he was appointed commander of 1st Army to participate in the march into northern Transylvania, his homeland. However, in a few months, he was forced into retirement, mainly due to his disagreements with Hendrik Werth, then commander-in-chief, who was already pushing for war. It was mainly because of his machinations that Hungary joined Operation Barbarossa, but events would soon take another turn. Regent Horthy, regretting the entry to the war, pushed back and replaced commander-in-chief Werth with Ferenc Szombathelyi, who was more loyal to him and less pro-German. In March 1942, he also appointed Miklós Kállai as Prime Minister, who was more sympathetic to the Allies and wanted a defense minister whom he could trust. In September of that year, Vilmos Nagy was recalled and tasked with leading the Ministry of Defense, where so many pro-war officers served. He was not one of them, his main objective was the preservation of the Royal Hungarian Army and the eventual return of all units that had been sent to the Soviet Union. This he could not achieve, but there was one area where he felt serious improvement could and should be made. When Nagy became defense minister, he tried his best to keep the army out of politics. He requested a retrial in the case of the Uyvidék massacre, whose perpetrators had misled the new commander-in-chief and Horthy himself. He then reviewed the case of the Jewish labor companies that had been sent to the Eastern Front with the not-so-covert intention to get rid of their members. He modified Order No. 5000, trying to ensure that these laborers would not be treated as prisoners, raising their food rations, improving their treatment, banning torture, and allowing the sick and wounded to return to Hungary. Immediately his own ministry, along with the general staff, tried to oppose him, and these two organizations would remain his main opponents. Already in October, Nagy visited Second Army at the front. On the way, he met Hitler at his HQ in Vinica, where the German leader explained how the Soviet Union would be conquered. Nagy remained cautious and distrustful towards the Germans, but he was more interested in the Hungarian security divisions that had to guard a vast region in Ukraine, partially covered by the infamous Bryansk forest. They had a hard time, but so did the frontline units at the Don, covering a dangerously wide section with only nine light divisions. Their only reserve 
was first armored field division, now under German command, to be released only with Hitler's permission. He also reviewed the Jewish labor companies, asking questions and taking notes. He recorded an encounter during which a brave laborer answered his question. To understand this, I have to note that in Hungarian the same word is used for company as a military unit and for century. When he asked which company it was, one member replied, I humbly report that this is the 20th century. Nagy looked up, but didn't say a word. In most companies, a significant improvement was felt as a result of his visit. More food was distributed, several unit commanders were replaced, the guards treated the laborers as human beings, and they even received letters from home. General Nagy detested the labor service for two main reasons. On the one hand, he condemned discrimination based on someone's heritage or religion. On the other, he believed it was an enormous waste to send Jewish doctors to the front to do physical labor when the country had a shortage in doctors. It also didn't make sense to him to fire skilled Jewish workers and replace them with untrained Christians because it hindered arms production efforts. However, there were too many younger anti-Semitic officers and many more who believed it was hopeless to resist German demands. Even after replacing some of the officials, he felt increasing opposition both in his ministry and in the general staff that was strongly pro-German. At the moment, he wasn't sure if Germany could actually win the war. He would only recognize the true situation months later, after his visit to the front. After bringing back the remnants of Second Army in early 1943, Nagy declined to send three Hungarian divisions to the Balkans or to send 10,000 Jews to the Bohr mine in Serbia. With the help of Major General Röder, he did improve the situation of Jewish laborers within the country, but he was already facing more attacks from the far right after declaring that the defense of the homeland does not distinguish between races and religions, only between good and bad soldiers. Even though Regent Horthy and Prime Minister Kalai still trusted him, he submitted his resignation in June, but he was followed by Kalai himself in March 1944, when German forces occupied Hungary. When Horthy was removed in October, the Arrow Cross Party gained power. A month later, the now-retired General Nagy was arrested and transported to Bavaria together with his brother. He was then moved between several prison camps under German and then American supervision, so he could only return to Hungary in 1946. When the communists took over in 1948, he also became under attack for serving in the Horthy regime, which was now labeled a fascist dictatorship. His houses and belongings were confiscated, he was forced into internal exile, he lost his pension, while his son was imprisoned. His only option was to do menial labor, but in the early 1950s, events took a surprising turn. Petru Groza, then Prime Minister of Communist Romania, sent him a letter, inviting him to a reunion. They had been classmates back in Transylvania before World War I. Nagy replied, explaining that he didn't have the means to travel, so he could only participate in spirit. Soon a black car arrived and took him to Budapest, where he received a new passport, a suit, and some money for the trip. He was able to join his old classmates, and by the time he returned in 1954, his pension was restored and his son was released. In 1959, his houses were returned, so he could finally enjoy relative peace and stability. International recognition came in 1965, when the Yad Vashem Institute of Jerusalem declared Vilmos Nagy righteous among the nations. Not a bad feat for a fascist general. In his remaining years, Nagy continued to review and edit his book that had originally been published in 1947, but had failed to gain much traction 
mostly due to political reasons. He died in 1976 at the age of 92 in Pilischaba, where a street preserves his name. His book was published again, and it's still available today.